Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this session on macroeconomic heterogeneity and monetary policy. Uh, we have four papers today, so the presentations will take 25 minutes, and then there will be five minutes of uh, questions. And uh, so please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, the first paper is by uh, Ambrogio Sabianchi. And uh, Amrodo, I guess you can start. So uh, thank you very much for having me. And thanks the organizers for putting together this <coughs> interesting session. Uh, so I'm going to present a paper today joined with uh, Gareth Anderson, who's at the IMF. And so the usual disclaimer uh, applies uh, for both the IMF and the Bank of England. So what we do in this paper uh, is um, to try and provide some new stylized facts, uh, new descriptive evidence on the transmission of monetary policy on the cross-section of firms. In particular, uh, what we do is to focus on firm level funding costs or the cost of external finance uh, for a large cross-section of firms. And uh, we're gonna try and see how firm level funding costs respond to changes in monetary policy, potentially in a heterogeneous fashion where the dimension of heterogeneity that we're going to consider is uh, the financial position of firms uh, as measured by firm uh, balance sheets. Now, we're going to focus on uh, two specific uh, uh, questions. The first one is uh, the following one. Uh, are financially constrained firms more or less responsive to changes in monetary policy? So um, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with this literature would know that uh, the answer to this question is uh, theoretically ambiguous as there are uh, different transmission mechanisms uh, that push uh, in different directions. But maybe more importantly or more interestingly, um, the empirical literature also has not settled on a definite answer to this question. As, as different studies uh, have found very different answers, uh, and I'm citing some of these studies uh, here on these slides. The second question we're going to ask is whether the estimated effects uh, of monetary policy on uh, uh, firm level outcomes are driven by frictions uh, in uh, the corporate sector or in the financial intermediation sector. In other words, what we're trying to do here is to, see, is to tease out whether the data is consistent with a view of the world as in, for example, Bernanke, Gerter, and Gilchrist, uh, where at the core of the model you have financial frictions between financial intermediaries and firms, or whether the data is consistent instead with a view of the world as in the Gerter, Karadi, Kyotaki uh, framework, where instead the, at the core of the model you have a friction between depositors and uh, firms. Now, uh, this is a, a quite challenging uh, question to ask empirically, and indeed uh, is often ignored uh, by firm level studies as the ones that I mentioned, uh, that I cite uh, in, in this first bullet. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, uh, these two different frameworks imply uh, similar equilibrium outcome responses uh, for firms. Why do we care about this? Well, uh, we do care about the answers to these questions because uh, uh, the answers are, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm doing something weird here. Uh, the answers are uh, uh, important for policy because they can inform what their monetary policy uh, can uh, be and, and how much it can be state dependent, uh, depending, for example, on uh, the cross-sectional distribution of, uh, uh, of balance sheets in the economy, but they can also be informative for the design of unconventional policies, which in a world where interest rates are gonna be uh, probably low for a long time is gonna be, uh, is gonna be important. Um, so what do we do in, uh, in the paper and what's our contribution? Um, uh, let me just start by uh, uh, reminding you of what uh, existing studies that try to answer similar questions do. Uh, these studies typically look at uh, the relative response of constrained firms to high frequency interest rate surprises. Uh, and the focus of these papers um, in most of the cases is on quantities such as investment, output, employment, and so on. Uh, 
at quarterly or even lower frequency, which is typically the highest frequency uh, uh, that is uh, available for such uh, firm level information. Differently in this paper, uh, we proceed as follows. We first construct a new uh, daily bond level data set. So it's a very granular daily, uh, daily uh, frequency bond level uh, data set that we then use to study the high frequency effect of monetary policy on firms' credit spreads. And finally, in the last step, we decompose uh, these estimated effects of monetary policy on credit spreads into an expected default and the risk premium component. Now, what we claim in the paper is that our approach is going to lead us to make significant progress uh, uh, in, uh, with respect to the two questions that I outlined in the previous slide. And in particular, uh, we are going to argue that the high frequency approach that we use leads to a much more credible identification of uh, monetary policy changes, as well as a more precise uh, estimation of its effects. While the focus on prices, uh, in addition to quantities, of course, uh, is going to help us a lot in trying to tease out the, different, the role of different frictions uh, that drive uh, the equilibrium uh, response of credit spreads. And this is going to be due to the fact that we're going to be able to decompose uh, credit spreads into an expected default and the risk premium component. So what we do and what we find practically, uh, we proceed in three steps in the paper. Uh, we start with a daily frequency firm level event study where we find that uh, first monetary policy hikes typically lead to an aggregate increase in credit spreads. We do find that the effect is larger for firms that have higher leverage, uh, which we uh, take as uh, our main measure of financial constraints, but we control and experiment with other different proxies. And finally, we find that uh, the risk premium component of credit spreads accounts for most of uh, uh, our estimated effects. So it accounts for most of the aggregate increase in credit spreads, but it also, it also accounts for uh, the larger response of credit spreads for firms that have higher leverage. We then complement our uh, quarterly, uh, our uh, daily frequency event study analysis with quarterly frequency local projections in uh, a very similar spirit to the existing literature. And here we're going to focus on firm level quantities, uh, specifically total debt and investments. And again, we're going to find that. Uh, the uh, cross-sectional patterns uh, of the response of debt and investment to monetary policy are consistent with the event study. So we're going to find that debt and investment uh, will contract more for firms that have high leverage. And we're also going to show that these effects are persistent at business cycle frequency. Finally, we develop a, a very simple theoretical framework that combines the elements uh, that I described in the previous slide. So frictions uh, on the firm side, a la Bernanke, Gerter, and Gilchrist, and, and frictions on the intermediaries, a la Gerter, Karadi, Kyotaki. And we're going to use this framework to try and interpret uh, the empirical evidence in this first uh, uh, two, uh, two parts of the paper. And through the lens of this simple framework, we're going to see that uh, uh, frictions in the financial intermediation sector uh, are going to be crucial to uh, understand uh, monetary the, the monetary policy transmission mechanism. So um, this is also basically what, what this is what we do in the paper is also uh, the structure of the presentation. Given the time, I think I'm going to mainly focus on the daily frequency uh, firm level event study. And if I have time, I'm going to briefly go through uh, the quarterly frequency local projections. Before doing that, uh, though, let me just quickly describe uh, the data uh, that we use, especially the bond level data that is a bit more uh, uh, novel and you might not be familiar with it. So uh, we're going to take bond data from uh, the ICE Bank of America Merrill Lynch uh, data set. Uh, we're going to have information on bonds that are traded in secondary market at daily frequency. And we're going to consider both investment grade and high yield uh, bonds. As I mentioned already, the key variable we're going uh, to use or we're going to focus on is uh, a, a credit spread, which is defined as the difference between uh, bond yields uh, on a given bond and a risk-free security. There are two important features uh, or characteristics of uh, the way in which we construct these credit spreads. The first one is a maturity matching, uh, 
which means that the risk-free security has to have the same maturity of the bond that we consider. And also, given that most bonds uh, uh, actually embed uh, call or put options, you want to remove uh, the pricing effects of these options from the credit spread. So there is an option adjustment that is very important uh, to avoid biases in, uh, uh, in the coefficients that we estimate at a later stage. Our sample period covers the 99-2017 period, so it's a relatively long uh, time series for a very large panel. Uh, we focus on non-financial senior unsecured bonds issued in US dollars uh, only. And let me just stress that the uh, data set we have covers a relatively large share of the market. For example, in 2014, the flow of new issuance uh, in, in our data set was around 70% of the total markets of US corporate bonds. We uh, apply a relatively standard uh, data treatment following different papers in the uh, corporate finance literature. And eventually we, uh, we merge our uh, bond level data with firm level information. We take quarterly balance sheet information uh, from CompuStats and daily equity price data from the CRSP. Um, just to give you an idea of how uh, our, uh, our bond level data set looks like, what you have in this chart is a, a time series of um, corporate bond spreads. So these are the optional adjusted spreads that I described a couple of slides ago. Um, and the solid line here uh, displays the median uh, corporate bond spread across all available bonds at any given point in time. And you can see that there is quite a lot of time series variation, clearly the big spike in the global financial crisis. But importantly, there is also a lot of cross-sectional variation at, very, at different points in time. And we're going to exploit exactly this cross-sectional variation to tease out some of the mechanisms that I described uh, before. Finally, a quick word on monetary policy. Uh, we're going to follow here the widely uh, used high frequency identification approach. Uh, we're going to start uh, taking uh, Fed fund futures around the FOMC announcements. And then we decompose these uh, raw interest rate surprises into a monetary and a non monetary component following the uh, AJ Macro approach uh, of Jaroszynski and Karadi. So what you have in these charts are uh, the, um, the, the raw surprises decomposed into the monetary and non-monetary component. What I'm going to be doing here is to mainly, at least in this presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, this epsilon M, which is uh, what you can think of, uh, of an exogenous monetary policy change. So our final data set uh, is going to be the combination of all this bond and firm level information into an event study data set around the FOMC announcements, announcements uh, which we denote with uh, T. The resulting data set covers almost 20 years of, of data. Uh, we have uh, uh, almost 160 FOMC announcements, around 9,000 bonds, uh, around 1,000 companies, and almost 300,000 of the observations. Okay, so let me jump into uh, the, the empirical uh, analysis, uh, which is uh, relatively simple. We use as, our, as, an, as an empirical approach an event study panel OLS regression. So it's, it's really simple panel OLS uh, methodology. You have on the left hand side uh, credit spreads. And uh, just quickly on the notation delta CS IJT, this object here. Uh, is the change in credit spreads of bond I issued by firm J around FOMC meeting at time T. And this is going to be on the left-hand side of our regression. The independent variable, as I mentioned, is the monetary policy surprise. And then we're going to consider as a cross-sectional variable a, uh, this, this variable J T minus one high. So this is going to be a dummy variable that takes value of one whenever uh, firm J's leverage in T minus one is above uh, the median of the leverage distribution. We define leverage as it is standard uh, in the literature as total debt over total assets. And we're going to control for other proxies of financial constraints such as age, uh, size, credit ratings, and et cetera. I'm going to show you some re uh, results uh, in a minute. Um, okay, so this is the simplest specification you can think of if you had your, uh, you know, our data set coded up in, in Stata. So the specification simply regresses changes in credit spreads around the FOMC meetings on a bond level uh, fixed effect and on the monetary policy shocks. 
So the coefficient beta here captures the response of spreads to monetary policy surprises, and we rescaled uh, the surprises such that you can interpret a beta as a response to a 25 basis points increase in uh, the policy rate. This is what we find. Uh, the coefficient that is reported here is positive and statistically significant and is, uh, is quite large, is economically uh, meaningful. Then we try and start <coughs> teasing out some, uh, some heterogeneity in our regressions. And the easiest way to do that is by uh, asking whether the response is different if you consider different groups of firms that have different leverage. We use therefore our dummy variables. And so the coefficients beta one and beta two here are gonna capture the response for firms that fall in either the high or the low uh, leverage uh, distribution of, of, of firms. Here is what we find. So beta one uh, is 21 basis points. And is, is so this is the response of firms that fall in the below the median of the leverage distribution. And you can see that it's positive, it's significant, and it's sensibly smaller than uh, the, um, the coefficient on beta two, which is instead the average response of firms in the high, uh, in, in, um, is the response of the firms that fall in the, uh, above the median of the leverage distribution. Now you might think, well, uh, okay, this is interesting evidence, but there might be a lot of factors and characteristics that correlate with leverage that are driving these cross-sectional responses. So what we do then is to progress and to make our specification more and more conservative. The first experiment we do here is to um, add uh, time sector fixed effects and to then interact the monetary policy shock with our high leverage dummy. So uh, this is a quite <clears throat> conservative specification in that the coefficient gamma now captures the relative response of high leverage firms in deviation to the average response of firms in a given sector. So that's that's how you should think of uh, coefficient gamma, which is reported in the third column of this table here. And again, you see that the coefficient is still quite large and uh, statistically significant. Now, um, the, the last concern you might have is that uh, even if you're controlling for time sector fixed effects, then it, it might be that leverage is correlated with other proxies for financial constraints, and so is not really directly responsible for uh, these cross, this different cross-sectional patterns we observe in the data. So what we do to take into account this concern is by running what we, what we call double sorting regressions, where basically we have the same time sector fixed effects <clears throat> as before. We have the same interaction of leverage with the monetary policy surprise, but we also add uh, an additional proxy for financial constraints that we also interact with the monetary policy surprise. So you should think of these uh, of these uh, regression as, as almost double sorting, let's, let's say that X is size. So the thought experiment would be for two firms of equal size, is leverage still a relevant uh, uh, cause for uh, cross-sectional differences in the response of credit spreads? So what I report here is our baseline uh, regression without the double interaction. And here we have uh, the, the results for the regression with double interaction for size, credit ratings, uh, age, as measured by the time since the IPO. And what you can see here, which I, which I really find interesting, is that the coefficient on leverage keeps on uh, being significant, but most importantly, the magnitude of this coefficient is, uh, is relatively stable across specifications. And this is true across many different uh, proxies for financial constraints. And let me stress, uh, especially th this one column two in this table, which is the distance to default measure. So this is basically saying that uh, for firms that have similar distance to default, leverage is still a relevant, uh, uh, a relevant variable that leads to different or differential response of credit spreads to a monetary policy surprise. Um, we have loads and loads of uh, robustness uh, exercises on, uh, on our uh, empirical, on this first part of our empirical analysis. So let me just jump into uh, the second and final bits of uh, what I'm going to show you today, which is, again, still a high-frequency event study, but the decomposition of credit spreads into a default risk component and, excess and an excess bond premium component. Um, so as I, as I tried to mention in my introduction, you know, the response of credit spreads to monetary policy that we estimated in the previous uh, section of the paper uh, 
could capture two different mechanisms. On the one hand, you might have a deterioration of the quality of borrowers' balance sheets, and this would be on the lines of the Kitaki Moore or BGG type of papers. But you could also have exactly the same equilibrium response of credit spreads if you instead had no deterioration whatsoever on the borrower side, but you would have a deterioration in the health of financial intermediaries. So um, what we do here um, to uh, try and tease out these two mechanisms is to follow the approach by Gilkas and Zakraishek that decompose credit spreads into a component that captures firms default risk and the residual component that they label an excess bond premium component. Now the EBP uh, uh, in, uh, in the interpretation of Gilkas and Zakraishek captures the variation in the price of bearing credit risk above and beyond the compensation that we require for expected defaults. And so it, it quite nicely fit into the distinction between these two channels because uh, in uh, this class of models, uh, the borrower balance sheet is tightly linked to the default probability of, of the firm. I'm gonna skip the decomposition, the description of this the decomposition. Uh, here is how it looks like. So we decompose spreads the solid line into the dashed and into the dotted line. And eventually what we do is to rerun our uh, two main regressions using on the left-hand side, either credit spreads, their default risk component and their excess bond premium component. So this is the average specification where beta captures the average effect on, on the panel. And what you can see here, uh, this is our baseline result I showed you before. You can see that this baseline result is virtually entirely driven by the excess bond premium component, while default risk accounts for a minimal, uh, minimal share of, of this coefficient, which is not statistically significant. Um, we then look at the heterogeneous response of these various components to monetary policy surprises, where we uh, use our specification with time sector fixed effects. And again, what you can see here is that uh, our baseline coefficient, which remember, uh, this is the relative response of a firm with high leverage in deviation from the average response in a given sector. So this coefficient, again, is virtually entirely driven by the excess bond premium component rather than the default risk component. And <clears throat> we interpret these, uh, these results, again, through the lens of, of our theoretical model, which I don't have time to show, as suggesting that frictions on the financial intermediary side are more important than frictions on, uh, on the firm side. Uh, I think I'm uh, almost out of time. Um, so let me just uh, skip the quarterly local projections and let me, I'm gonna describe them by, by, by concluding. So uh, what we have in, in this paper is some, uh, some, some new facts. Uh, which mainly relates the response of credit spreads to monetary policy uh, surprises. We showed that uh, credit spreads tend to increase on average in response to a policy hike. We, tend, we show that this, should, this, uh, this effect is larger for firms that have higher leverage and that the transmission seems to be driven by a component that is, that is beyond what investors require for uh, expected defaults. What I haven't showed you, uh, but is in the paper, is that these, uh, these cross-sectional patterns uh, also hold when we consider uh, the response of debts or investment uh, at quarterly frequency, even though they're much less precisely estimated. So let me just conclude with the implication uh, of, of what we do. Uh, the first thing I would like to stress is the importance of high frequency analysis to complement uh, more traditional business cycle frequency analysis as we, uh, we show in the paper that it leads to much better identification and more precise estimation of the effects of monetary policy uh, on firm level outcomes. And secondly, uh, in terms of uh, the economics of what we do, when we interpret uh, these empirical results through the lens of a model that has frictions on both firms and financial intermediaries, we, we tend to uh, interpret our results as supportive of uh, frictions in the financial intermediation sector being very important in shaping the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, I hope I'm in time, Katerina, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Yeah, perfect, your time. And so if the panelists have any questions, they could intervene directly. Instead, I would encourage the attendees to write the questions in the Q&A.
Uh, I have a question today for uh, Ambrogio. Please. What is the interpretation of a firm specific EVP? And that is dependent on firm leverage. Because I would think that uh, firm leverage is mainly going to affect the expected default premium. Whereas the EVP comes more from, if it comes from the bank, uh, I would think it is more homogeneous across firms. So, what is the interpretation of this EVP being heterogeneous across firms according to their uh, leverage position? So, so um, thanks for the question. I think it's an interesting one and, and a tricky one as well. Um, so, um, l let me start by answering with the interpretation of the EBP as in Gilchrist and Zakrajcik, which uh, is the average of all those residuals uh, across, uh, across the uh, various bonds. So let me just go back here. So what, strictly speaking, the excess bond premium is the average of the residuals of this pricing equation for credit spreads across all I's and all J's. And if you believe that there is a single representative um, financial intermediary or marginal buyer of these bonds, then uh, my interpretation of Gilchrist and Zakrajcik's work is that they interpret this average as something that is quite that is relatively close to, let's say, the stochastic discount factor of this marginal buyer of, uh, of corporate bonds. Now, in reality, uh, there is not a single buyer. There might be uh, different players in, uh, um, in, in the corporate bond market. And so uh, each, uh, IJ, each of these residuals is gonna be, a, is gonna be, a, a, uh, is gonna be depending on who's the marginal buyer uh, of, of those bonds. So I think you, you should think of these uh, bond-specific um, uh, residuals as, as capturing potentially heterogeneity across, uh, across different, uh, uh, different buyers of, of bonds. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's not, yeah, I think what's not super intuitive is like why the marginal discount factor of the buyer should uh, vary with leverage for something <clears throat> that is, apart from like the expected default. Uh, so that's what I was trying to figure out. Okay, so that's, that's, another, that's another kind of important question. And here, um, um, so the answer here is that, um, let me try and see whether I have something. So the intuition here is that you can think of, you know, an increase in the EBP as, an, as a shift in the credit supply curve, which is basically uh, this dotted, this, this, the shift in, in, the, in the credit supply lines, the upward sloping curves uh, to, to the left, right? And the point here is that if um, for a firms with higher leverage, if you have an increase in a intermediary specific EBP, you will have a shift in, in that intermediary specific supply curve. And that's, and, and then you should think of like two firms, one with high leverage and one with low leverage, who borrow from that specific intermediary, uh, which experience therefore the same shift in the credit supply curve. And this would imply a differential response of credit spreads to that shift in the intermediary specific credit supply curve. Um, it's, it's a bit tricky to explain it in, uh, uh, without going through the model, but I, I hope I, did, I, I gave you the intuition for what's going on. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I look, I look at the paper. Uh, I'm starting to see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there is a final question, but actually we are out of time. So maybe you can give a very brief question. That is by Philip Poynton. Uh, so it's very interesting presentation in line with the first question. Could the estimated short term effect also in part be driven by bond holders characteristics? In the sense that bond of highly levered firm might be mostly held by investors that react more quickly to monetary policy ch changes. Okay, so if, if I understand correctly, I, I think 
if I understand correctly the question, uh, I think I'm in agreement with uh, um, with you in the sense that you know one concern you might have is that uh, there is a uh, systematic correlation between, let's say, highly leveraged investors and highly leveraged firms, um, which is something unfortunately we can't control in, in our data set because we can't control for who's holding actually these bonds. Um, but, uh, and so there is another angle to this question, which is uh, really related to what I was trying to explain uh, before, which is if there is heterogeneity across, um, across the holders of these bonds, then uh, you really would want to kind of be able, you really would want to have the, the EBP that is specific to each bond to be able to capture uh, some of these effects. But, um, but again, I think, uh, going through this uh, bit without having seen the theoretical model is a bit complicated and I'm happy to, you know, catch up bilaterally on these questions if you have more. So feel free to either email me or you can chat on, on Zoom. Okay, very good. So thank you very much, Ambrogio. And now we move to the second presentation on consumption heterogeneity, micro drivers and macro implications by Edmund. Uh, please, Edmund, share your slide. Uh, well, um, thank you um, for for coming to this and and inviting me to this uh, to this panel. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the paper "Consumption Heterogeneity: Micro Drivers and Macro Implications," um, and this is joint work uh, with um, Andreas Kukla at uh, Denmark's National Bank. Um, and I should say that uh, nothing we're going to say here uh, represents the views of the Federal Reserve Board or Denmark's National Bank. Um, okay, so what is what is this paper about, and what are we doing? So it's an empirical paper, um, and we're going to estimate the consumption response uh, to permanent and transitory shocks to income for different groups of households. Um, so let me just unpack that a little bit. So essentially, we're measuring marginal propensities to consume um, to permanent transitory shocks. So, um, so, so, so that, this is obviously a very old question. So what is, um, uh, what is, the, what is the problem here? Well, why can't you just uh, regress um, consumption on, on income? Um, it kind of boils down to Friedman's permanent income hypothesis that the consumption response you might expect in a permanent income hypothesis type world is very, very different for permanent shocks to income and transitory shocks to income. Um, so if you just regress uh, consumption on change, change in consumption on change in income and you get some number between zero and one, you don't really, you haven't really said anything about uh, the underlying um, dynamics of consumption behavior. So we're going to try and decompose um, uh, consumption responses to permanent and transitory shocks to income and then we're going to dig down into how, vo how those responses may uh, differ for different, um, different types of households. Um, so, so hasn't this done, been done before? So obviously this is a kind of very old uh, question going right back to Keynes, kind of what is a marginal propensity to consume? It's been um, of great interest to a lot of people, not least macroeconomists. Um, so what do we do differently? So we have a, kind of a couple of things. So, so the first is that our method addresses bias in previous results. So in order to measure marginal propensities to consume, economists have generally uh, kind of used three different methods. Um, one is to, to, to just ask people um, and say, you know, if I gave you $100, how much of it would you spend over the next month? Um, another is to find some kind of natural experiment. Um, and both of those methods tend to get very high marginal propensities to consume when you, when you, when you look at that in that way. Um, but there's there's another kind of uh, collection of methods, um, kind of um, where, which which is um, Blundell, Pistoferi, and Preston is a prominent example of that, um, where you're trying to um, write down, uh, use panel data on consumption and income, um, and try and uh, pick out, uh, write down some kind of structural um, uh, uh, equations so that you can pick out transitory and permanent shocks, and uh, and derive the uh, the consumption response to those. <laughs> And those, those methods up to now have, have suffered from uh, a, a time aggregation problem, which I'll explain later, and our method ad addresses that. And the, the second thing is that we have um, registry data from Denmark um, uh, for, uh, so we have panel data from Denmark, which basically covers the entire Danish population. So we have a sample size of, of millions rather than a few thousand. Um, and, that, and that allows us to really dig down into the heterogeneity um, of these consumption responses, which has been very difficult to do with the types of uh, survey data sets that um, are generally, have generally historically been used for this type of thing. 
Um, so why do we care about this? Um, so, uh, so in, in particular, why do we care about heterogeneous and consumption responses? Um, so there's this whole new set of heterogeneous agent models that have testable micro behavior. And I guess in particular, one, one very testable implication is that um, the households that uh, have high NPCs are those with low liquid wealth. Um, and you know, it'd be useful to, to be able to test that um, in, in very concrete ways, which is what we're able to do in this paper. And the other thing is that we can quantify some of the macro implications. So in particular in this paper, we look at um, heterogeneity of, of marginal prices to consume across uh, different types of households with respect to how, um, how their balance sheets will be impacted by monetary policy. So monetary policy has a redistributive effect um, that may have important aggregate um, implications. And we can measure that uh, using, uh, using uh, this method and this data. So, so what do we find? So the first, the first kind of uh, dimension of heterogeneity we will look over is, uh, is um, how much liquid wealth households have. Um, and so we find that um, the, the kind of the households in Denmark with the lowest uh, liquid wealth, um, maybe unsurprisingly, are, are live pretty much hand to mouth. So um, whether they get a transitory shock or a permanent shock to their income, we see that they spend about 85 cents out of that, out of that, those marginal, that marginal dollar. So they have very high MPC living pretty much hand to mouth. Um, perhaps a little bit more surprisingly, if we look at the, the highest, um, the, the households with the highest amount of liquid wealth, um, so in a permanent income hypothesis or, um, model or, a buffer, or most of our buffer stock type models, these households would be able to completely smooth over any transitory shock to their income. Um, we actually find that they, they seem to respond quite strongly to transitory shocks to their income. So they have an MPC of about 25 cents in the dollar. Um, to transitory shocks to their income, um, and, and also relative to these permanent income hypothesis or buffer stock models, a relatively small response to permanent shocks to income. So they, if, they get a, if their um, income increases by $1,000 every year permanently, they'll only increase their spending, it seems, by $600 of, of that $1,000. Um, and, and furthermore, this, um, this dimension of liquid wealth seems to accurately predict um, consumption behavior or MPCs across every other dimension that we end up looking at um, in the paper. Um, so, so we focus particularly on uh, this kind of redistribution effect of monetary policy. And in Denmark, we find that the population divides kind of naturally um, into three, uh, three groups of people. Uh, so, so on the left here, we have what, what kind of basically the middle class. So we have people who are, who are, who are reasonably wealthy, they own houses and they own the cars. Um, but they have, a, you know, if they have a house, they'll have a large mortgage attached to that house. Um, if they have a car, they'll probably have a car loan attached to a car. Um, and um, and so, so they're kind of a middle class type people. You have another group of people who have neither any assets nor any debts. And, and these kind of a hand to mouth type people. And then a group on the right who are very wealthy. They own their houses, they own their cars, and they also sit on a large pile of uh, financial assets, um, essentially the debt of these guys on the left. Uh, so, what, so what do we find? So, I, so in this paper, I'm actually going to talk about uh, MPX, which is a marginal propensity to expend, um, which you can basically think of as an MPC, uh, but it's, it includes durable goods. So that's why I call it a marginal propensity to expend or MPX. And we find that this um, group on the left um, has an MPX of about 0.5. Um, the group with neither any assets nor any debts has a very high MPX of 0.8, while the wealthy um, about 0.25. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some, some, some stuff going on in the text box, but I can't actually see it. So if, if uh, Katarina wants to interrupt me, I'm happy to be interrupted, but I can't read those myself. Um, so if there's an um, interest rate hike, then um, that effectively acts as a, a well, part of what that does is act as a redistribution from uh, the people who have to pay that higher interest rate to the people who are going to receive that higher interest rate. So from this middle class group to this kind of wealthy group, um, and it doesn't directly affect the, the group who um, have neither assets nor debts. Um, and as these, as these uh, middle class group have a, have a much higher um, MPX, um, they will decrease their spending a lot because they're having to, um, they're having to give more of their money to, to service their debt. Um, and these guys who receive it will only increase their spending a little. Uh, and so we estimate that just through this redistribution channel, um, if the one-year uh, real interest rate goes up by 1%, 
then aggregate spending will go down um, by 26 basis points, um, just, just from this one redistribution channel alone in Denmark, um, which is, uh, a, a, which w a relative to other channels seems um, like a large and important factor. Okay, so now I'll move on to uh, the methodology and what we actually do. So um, we're essentially making identifying restrictions on the income process and the consumption process, and we'll do it in continuous time. So for income, we do a very standard uh, decomposition, um, which is very common in literature, to divide um, uh, the income process into, or the idiosyncratic income process, into permanent and transitory components, where the permanent component is a random walk, and we define the transitory component as, as being kind of a shock to income, which lasts for less than two years. So maybe you lose your job for, for up to two years, or, um, or maybe you get a bonus and it's just a one-off uh, factor, but it's, it's any kind of transitory shock to income which lasts less than two years. And then similarly, on the consumption side, um, we assume that if you have a permanent shock to your income, you change your consumption or you change your expenditure um, in a permanent way, so your consumption, um, your consumption response to a permanent uh, to permanent income shocks also follows a random walk. Um, well, if you have a transitory shock to your income, uh, that consumption response we, we make the assumption that it also um, is short lived and lasts less than two years, um, and that's kind of following uh, a bunch of um, empirical evidence from other studies. Um, and we can we 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 also test that in the um, in our appendix in our robustness tests, and. We do this all in continuous time, and the reason we do this in continuous time is to avoid the time aggregation uh, problem that has um, that has been a large problem for previous uh, similar studies. Um, and I'll explain that uh, shortly. Um, but before I show you uh, the results, I want to I want to kind of show you uh, some intuition about why the results we're going to see come out from the data. So first of all, I'm just going to do a kind of naive regression of changing consumption in change in income. So if you didn't have any kind of um, knowledge about transitory income or transitory and permanent shocks, and you just wanted to see, well, let's regress change in consumption on change in income, what would that look like? And in particular, and I'm going to do it over different numbers of years. So this is this is going to be the change in consumption on the, regressing the change in consumption on the change in income over one year. This is regressing the change in consumption over change in income in ten years. And I'll, I'll try and explain um, what you might expect to see in various different models. So if you had complete markets, um, all, these, all these idiosyncratic shocks to income uh, would be, um, would be uh, insured out and there'd be no consumption response at all. So you'd kind of you'd see this uh, flat line here at zero. If you had a, a solo type model where people uh, spend, say, 75 cents out of, out of, their, out of, the, out of their income and save 25 cents, um, then uh, and and they and they don't respond any differently to permanent or transitory shocks. Then you would just see a straight line at seventy five cents, a little bit like that. Um, our, our buffer stock or permanent income hypothesis type models are going to end up looking like this, and this is essentially because if you regress change in income on change in income over change in consumption on change in income over one year, you're really getting a lot of transitory variance. Whereas if you look at it over ten years, you're really picking up mostly permanent variance. And because of these models, you can kind of smooth over most of the transitory variance, you get a lower number here, and at that, that will asymptote towards one um, as you go out uh, to infinity. And so what does, what does the data in Denmark actually look like? Um, it's kind of, it kind of surprised me that it's, uh, it seems to be much less consumption smoothing than you might imagine. It kind of looks much more like people don't necessarily differentiate too much between permanent and transitory shocks. Um, and you see it, it looks somewhat much more like the solar model. Um, but this uh, hides a lot of heterogeneity. Um, so if you look at the least liquid households in Denmark, um, they, have, uh, they, have, they really are not doing any consumption smoothing. You can see very clearly that whether, whether, you regress, whether you're looking at over short-term changes or long-term changes, they're pretty much are spending uh, 85 or 90% of, the, of their income, whatever the type of shock. Um, whereas the most liquid households are clearly doing some kind of consumption smoothing, but not in the way that our buffer stock type models suggest. Um, in particular, much much less consumption smoothing to transitory shocks, and mu sorry, much much less consumption to, to smoothing to transitory shocks, and much more to permanent shocks. It would seem. So let me um, try and explain a little bit about the, the um, time aggregation problem 
uh, that has existed in previous uh, previous work. So in particular, the, the the there's a kind of question: Why do we not follow the Blundell, Pistol, Perry, and Preston 2008 paper, which basically tries to do exactly the same thing? Uh, they use the PSID data, but their their what they're trying to do is very similar. Um, so the key to uh, the Blundell, Pistol, Perry, and Preston identification is that the change in income uh, next year is going to be a valid instrument for transitory shocks this year. Um, and the reason that that's kind of claimed to be true is that if we have a, if we have a transitory shock in year T, so this is, our, this is our income, it goes up and then it comes down, so this is a transitory shock in year T, the change in income is going to go up in year T and then down in, in the following year. So the change in income in year T plus one is going to be negatively correlated with transitory shocks in year T. Okay. And similarly, if you have a permanent shock in year T, then your income goes up and stays up. So your change in income goes up in year T, but is zero in T plus one. So changes in um, income in year T plus one are, are going to be uncorrelated with permanent shocks in year T. And it's, and it's this that allows uh, London Office of Harry and Preston to uh, to use the change in income in year T plus one as an instrument for transitory shocks. But this, this fact, the, this, this fact that changes in income in year T plus one are uncorrelated with permanent shocks in year T um, fails due to uh, time aggregation. So let me try and explain just quickly what that is. So, um, so if you were receiving a salary of $50,000, you receive that every two weeks or every month as a, as a, as a paycheck. Um, and, you're, and you might get a, a shock to your permanent income halfway through a year. So here I've got a picture where at time 1.5, so halfway through this year, uh, some of the household salary jumps from 50,000 to 100,000. So this is just a one-off one shock kind of following this random walk type idea. But in the, in the tax data, what we'll observe is actually the aggregated income that was received over each tax year. So in this year, aggregating all this, you get 50,000 in this year. But over this second year, they received 50,000 in the first year, the first half of the year, and 100,000 in the second half of the year. So in the tax data, you'll actually see $75,000, and then the next year, $100,000. So although there's kind of a, only a one-off shock, and this is kind of a random walk type thing, we're going to get this kind of smoothed out um, effect in the, um, in the actual observed data that we have. And this ends up actually being a really um, big problem because observed permanent income growth is, is positively autocorrelated. So BPP misinterprets permanent income shocks as negative transitory shocks. Um, and so in fact, uh, if the permanent income hypothesis were true, uh, so, there, so there'd be um, no response at all to transitory shocks in, in reality, the BPP method would estimate the, um, the response to be minus, uh, minus 0.6. So, this, so it's a really, really large bias that comes through through this uh, time aggregation problem. So that's why um, we have to sort of write this all down in continuous time um, and, uh, and we get very different results to BPP as a result. And, and, our, and our results are very much in line with, so much, we get much, much higher MPCs uh, than BPP, um, very much in line with the natural uh, experiment literature um, and, and when you ask people kind of how much they're gonna spend. Um, so we use uh, um, panel data on income and expenditure from Denmark um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. Um, we, what, what we do is we, in, we so we don't have direct um, uh, expenditure data, but we can impute expenditure from income and asset data. Um, so, but let me let me move straight to results because I don't have a huge amount of time. So these are the MPXs by liquid wealth quint quantile. Um, for, perma for the permanent uh, MPX and the transitory MPX. So the blue lines here are the transitory MPX and across here are the um, quintiles of liquid wealth. So the, the, this, uh, this is the 20% of households with the lowest liquid wealth in Denmark on the left here. And they, over the 10 years of our sample period, they on average have uh, less than $2,000 uh, of liquid wealth. Um, and you can see that this group of people um, are, are spending sort of 90, 85 to 90% of their income, uh, whether, it, whether it's a response to a permanent shock or a transitory shock. The group on the right are the 20% uh, of uh, Danish households with the most liquid wealth. And so they, have, um, they all have more than $30,000 of liquid wealth. 
Um, and you can see here that, um, that their, their, their response to permanent shocks is, is to spend about 60 cents out of every dollar of permanent shock and their response to transitory shocks about uh, 25 cents in every dollar. Uh, and, and these results are actually very robust to the assumptions we made. So we obviously made some pretty strict assumptions about the income process and the consumption process. Um, they're actually very robust to other types of uh, changes you can make to those process, processes. And I, I hope you can kind of see why they may be so robust by looking back at this kind of uh, naive regression we had. So you can see, especially for this liquid, li least liquid wealth group, that um, it's, very, it was, it's, almost, it's very difficult to write down a model uh, where you don't get this, uh, this kind of result coming out from this straight line here where um, the, changes, the changes to consumption regressed on changes in income are, are pretty much similar throughout um, the, the number of years that you, you do that regression over. Um, there's a little bit more room for misspecification for this uh, most liquid group here, um, but, um, but uh, our robustness check suggests that it's actually, you know, these numbers are, are fairly, seem to be fairly reliable, certainly I believe them. Um, okay, so we then look at, um, we, we then look at how this, uh, at um, heterogeneity and, MP, and MPXs across the types of dimensions that are important for monetary policy uh, redistribution. And in particular, we look at unhedged interest rate exposure. So these guys on the left here, um, are very exposed to interest rates going up in the sense that if interest rates go up, they're going to have to um, spend, uh, if interest rates go, if, if this year's interest rate goes up, they're going to have to spend um, a lot more financing their debt because they have variable rate mortgages or, or some kind of debt which is, going to, which is going to have to be rolled over at a new rate. These guys on the right are going to benefit um, from higher interest rates because they will receive that, of those higher interest rates payments. So you can see this kind of clear hump-shaped pattern where the guys on the left have kind of a medium MPX, these guys in the middle have very high, and then it comes, it comes low again to the right. And just to show you a little bit about who, who, the, who these people are, if you look at home ownership, you can see the guys on the left and the right are homeowners, while the guys in the middle um, tend to be renters. Um, so the left and the right seem to be sort of similar in that sense. Uh, but then if you look at liquid assets um, holdings, you, get, you, see, you see the difference between the left and the right. So the liquid assets of these guys is, 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 is low, but not super low. It goes very low to this middle group who um, really have uh, seemingly no, no liquid assets at all. And then pretty much all these liquid assets are being held by these guys right on the right. Um, um, so what we so, so, so we, these results here um, are, from, are from applying our um, methodology to identify MPX for these different groups of people with different uh, unhedged interest rate exposures. But what we actually found is that just by knowing the liquid wealth of each group, we can really highly accurately predict what, their, what the MPX of that group is going to be. So here, this is, um, so, so this, this graph here is actually the same as, the same as this one here. Um, and the blue lines are exactly the same where we've estimated the MPX for each group. Well, the red lines are what we would guess the MPX to be if all we knew about that group was their liquid asset holdings. And you can see that we match this pattern really very well. And similarly, if we look at net, net wealth and all we know about them um, is their liquid wealth, then we can, we can get their, their uh, transit MPX really very accurately. Uh, so to conclude, um, this paper has a new method to estimate consumption behavior uh, we correct for bias in Blundell, Pistoferi, and Preston. Um, our, our estimates very much align with natural experiment uh, literature, which kind of gives us confidence that, uh, you know, that it's, it's nice when, when things agree. Um, uh, there's, and there's potential to use this, I think, on a wide variety of data sets and applications. And in particular, you know, there's a lot of, um, in the US, there's kind of these um, uh, JP Morgan uh, type data sets where we have, uh, which are just coming online, uh, which this could be used on. Um, we've applied it to the Danish registry data. Uh, we have this huge sample size, which allows us to really get sharp focus on heterogeneity. Uh, we find high MPCs from transitory shocks and low MPCs from permanent shocks, at least relative to some of our theories. Um, uh, liquid wealth, we find liquid wealth is sufficient to determine uh, MPCs, um, and we're able to quantify monetary policy transmission channels. Um, so thank you very much. So thank you very much. Okay.
Okay. So I'm going to present. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I'm going to present a joint work uh, with uh, my colleague, uh, the Paul Matthias Faustian, and the uh, usual disclaimer applies. And uh, we're going to talk about household debt and the heterogeneous effects of forward guidance. So, as all of you know, forward guidance has been used by many central banks, and uh, in particular, it has been shown um, that uh, the power of forward guidance is very strong, actually, uh, too strong in the uh, the standard representative agent new convention model, the rank model. Um, and what that, we have like two amplifying effects for guidance in these frameworks. First of all, you have what people have called an anti horizon effect, meaning that uh, the initial impact on output uh, of future rate decline does not decrease with the forward guidance horizon. It is like uh, being like the, uh, the time at which the central bank announces it will uh, lower interest rates in the future. And then it has been shown that uh, um, the that ZLB uh, for organs can be very powerful um, in, the, in, the, in the rank models. Um, quickly, why is that the case? So we can consider two types of for guidance experiment. The first experiment we label it a real rate for guidance, in which the um, central bank lowers the real rate, announces that it will lower the real rate uh, in a period T plus K in the future by an amount delta while keeping the real rate constant in all preceding, preceding periods. So what happens in the standard representative agent model is that uh, by linearizing the oil equation, we have that the change in output uh, today and time t is, is given by the sum of all the future changes in the interest rate without any discounting. This implies that in any period pre, prior to t plus k, output is going to increase by Sigma where sigma is the intertemporal digital substitution times delta, where delta is the change in interest rate. So for any horizon, the, the initial jump in output is going to be constant in this type of experiment. On the other hand, inflation, which de depends on the sum of all future output gaps, um, is going to, uh, the impact on inflation is going to be increasing in, uh, in the horizon, but this doesn't have uh, any impact if uh, in this type of experiment because the real rate is kept fixed. Another experiment that uh, uh, people have used to look at the power of forward guidance is what we call the nominal rate for guidance, in which again the, for the central bank lowers the real rates in a period t plus k by the same amount, but in this case it keeps only the nominal rate constant, so that uh, the real rate is allowed to move in the periods preceding uh, uh, period t plus k. In this case, we have an additional amplifying effect coming from the fact that, again, the impact on inflation is increasing in K, and this implies that the real rate uh, uh, starts uh, going down more and more uh, the farther in the future uh, is the announcement. So that in this case, instead of being constant, the impact, the initial, input, uh, the initial output rises more the farther in the future the forecast occurs. And this feedback loop is very powerful at the ZLB, where the nominal rate uh, is kept constant. So a recent trend of literature has looked at uh, the question, is for organics more still powerful in egg models? And you get, uh, um, say that you get like very uh, contrasting answers. So the first paper is by McKay, Nakamura, and Steinson, and they introduced the idea that uh, in a, a Hank model, the heterogeneous agent in the model, uh, precautionary models dampen the agent's response to future changes in the interest rate. Uh, because of uh, what they call a discount interest rate. So like the possibility of hitting the constraint in the future uh, introducing, a introducing a discounting that like dampens the impact of this, of this, uh, of our guidance. On the other hand, Verning uh, says that actually it depends. It depends on the cyclicality of income risk and of liquidity and points out that the results in MNS uh, depend a lot on auxiliary assumption on distribution of taxes and dividends. And this is something, a similar message is also the one uh, by BB, and it says that the, the impact depends on the cyclicality of risk and of inequality. Uh, then there is a recent paper by Agador and Cotters where, where they say that instead, if they introduce uh, wage stickiness and nominal government debt, uh, again, uh, the result of McKenna Congress times on holds. This is like uh, four guys is weaker in these uh, uh, inact models. And finally, in the most recent paper, Farid Verney, Said that not to, to weaken for guidance in this type of models, you need both level K thinking, so like a limited rationality and uh, heterogeneous model. 
soprattutto in this paper, in all the literature that I've uh, studied so far, like a missing element is that there is no private data. So these are all models where the, there is a borrowing constraint, but uh, uh, the debt limit is set at zero. So the borrowing constraint means that Azure cannot borrow. So we introduce, what we do is we, we look at the effects of organs in Hank model where uh, there are no redistributive effects on taxes or dividends. We kill all, kill all these confounding forces. We introduce borrowing and lending, so by allowing for a power, positive borrowing limit. And also we introduce long-term bonds. In this way, we can focus on the main redistributive channels of our guidance that have not been studied so far, and then operate to fluctuation in interest rates, inflation, and asset prices. Uh, as it, it, it has been pointed out by O'Claire in his paper about the distributive effects of standard monetary policy. So what are the main results? So we, sh we are going to show that uh, uh, the, introduction, the introduction of long-term debt um, creates three redistributive channels that affect the, the power of forward guidance in a Hank model. First of all, there is what we call a transfer news channel. It comes from the fact that uh, lower future interest rates imply future distribution from savers to borrowers, uh, which lowers precautionary motives today, especially for unconstrained borrowers. And so this pushes up consumption and amplifies the power of foreign okay, no, This is the third channel. Then there is the second channel, which is a standard feature channel, and it applies when bonds are nominal. And it comes from the fact that uh, lower future interest rate cause like uh, inflation to jump on impact, and this creates uh, uh, the deflation that uh, uh, brings about an unexpected transfer to borrowers with high MPC, especially constrained ones. And so this pushes consumption consumption up, and also this channel amplifies the power for our guidance. Then long-term bonds introduce another channel that we call uh, the devaluation channel, um, and the impact of the channel changes uh, according to whether we consider real bonds or nominal bonds. Particularly if bonds are real. Higher future interest rates imply that uh, the price of the bonds is going to go up. And so the debt burden for like constrained borrowers who cannot uh, uh, adjust uh, their bond holding today uh, goes up. So the consumption goes down, and this uh, diminishes the power for our guidance. On the other hand, if, if bonds are nominal, the higher future path of the inflation that is implied by our guidance uh, pushes the price of the long-term debt down. So in this case, the debt burden for borrowers goes down and consumption goes up, and this channel amplifies the power of our guidance. And I'm going to illustrate the, the, the effect of these three channels, like uh, looking at uh, experiments with uh, no real rate for our guidance and nominal rate for our guidance. And then if I have time, I will show that uh, uh, how these three channels uh, uh, operate in a liquidity trap when, when the economy is at the ZLB. And what I will show you that is that uh, for nominal bonds, uh, as you see, like all of these channels tend to amplify the effect of foreign guidance, making foreign guidance in the rank model like more powerful than uh, foreign guidance in the rank model in the equity trap. Whereas for real bonds, if the debt maturity is long enough so that this uh, debt evaluation channel is strong enough, we are going, it's, it's possible that the power of foreign guidance in the rank model is actually a lower than the power in the rank model. Now, let me quickly go through the model. The, the, the framework is the same as the one used by uh, McCain, Akimor, and Stanson. So in a nutshell, is a model where households face idiosyncratic level income productivity, uh, shocks, and uh, they only have access to risk-free bonds subject to a borrowing constraint. Um, in addition, there are monopolistically, that is the new Canadian part, with you know, new monopolistically competitive intermediate goods producers, that said price is subject to carbon friction. And as anticipated, the key different assumptions that we make are the following. First of all, we assume a positive borrowing constraint so that households can also borrow. Uh, then we assume that bonds are in zero in supply so that there is no redistributive effects of government taxes. And uh, we also assume that dividends that arise from monopolistic, uh, monopolistic competition are dis distributed proportionally to labor income. And I will show that this implies that there is no redistributive effects of dividend, because this, these effects can be very strong and smaller and uh, uh, drive the results. And finally, we, use, uh, we introduce bo uh, long-term bonds um, and so uh, study the impact, uh, the redistributive effects of fluctuations in bond prices. QT is the price of uh, 
of long-term bonds. So the main, uh, uh, so the main, let me go quickly over the household problem, which is like the most important part of the model, um, which is pretty standard. Household uh, choose consumption, labor, and bond holding in order to maximize the standard utility function. Subject to a budget constraint, where on the left hand side we have expenditure for consumption and saving in bonds if B is positive, otherwise, this represents borrowing if B is negative. They must be equal to on the right hand side, we have like income, labor income, where Z is the synchronity productivity and W is the real wage. We have the, the, the return on the bond, so if, again, if B is positive, this is a positive return, otherwise, this implies a negative return coming from the um, borrowing coming from the fuse period. And then households are uh, given like a share of aggregate dividends and uh, that which depends on, uh, on each household. And I will be more specific on that in a minute. And then there are taxes, but in, in, our, in our calibration, taxes are going to be Z equal to zero, so they don't really matter. And uh, again, uh, as is under in these models, uh, households are facing borrowing constraints. So the total amount they, can, they borrow has to be are greater or equal than an amount of P-bar. So one of the main differences compared to the MNS paper is that uh, we assume that debt is long-term. So like households can use, uh, can issue, um, or like can save in long-term uh, debt, B tilde, with a price Q. So if we, this, the, the B in the budget constraint is, if we, uh, is actually equal to the total amount borrowed, so B times Q, so the total amount borrowed at times T, uh, we can express the return on bonds as being a function of delta B, where delta B is the amortization rate, uh, the price of the bond, QT, in case the bonds are real. So this is standard like return where delta B represents like, it says it's the coupon payment, and one minus delta B times Q is the value of the outstanding debt. Uh, whereas uh, if uh, bonds are nominal, there is also a term uh, uh, capturing the deflation at one minus pi there. Notice that if delta B is equal to one, we are back to the one period debt. So as in, in, in mechanical number of times, so in this case, if delta is equal to one, we have that uh, Q is equal to one over R, where R, R is the real rate. So we can play with this delta to see uh, how things change when we go back to the one period debt. Um, and the standard and arbitrage condition requires that the expected return on bonds is equal to the is equal to the real rate. And as a standard in this model, the idiosyncratic income uh, process follows uh, a, a Markov process with a, a given transition probability. So again, this is a very standard. Uh, the main difference is like the, the return on, on long-term bonds. Uh, the rest of the model, I will go over it very quickly. Uh, if we call gamma as the distribution of houses over the bond holdings and productivity, we have a standard budget constraint for the governments where total taxes are equal to uh, the total payment on uh, the stock of debt, B bar, but we assume that B bar is equal to zero, so uh, taxes can be zero in our framework. Unless uh, uh, stated differently, we're going to use a very standard model, Taylor uh, rule for uh, that covers monetary policy, which responds uh, to inflation. So finally, in equilibrium, uh, we have the following market clearing condition, the total bond hold Link by the household has to be equal to the uh, total stock of current debt. In our calibration, this is equal to zero, so that these are in zero in supply. Uh, aggregate labor is equal to the uh, labor supply by each household weighted by the productivity. The production function is very simple, it's a linear production function in labor. And dividends are uh, simply going to be equal by, to output minus the uh, the labor cost. And finally, the aggregate resource constraint simply states that consumption has to be equal to output. Now, again, the, the main assumptions that uh, 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 are important for results is that B bar is assumed to be positive, and we'll, we'll see short in the calibration. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the total stock of debt is equal to zero, so there are no taxes. And finally, it can be shown that if you assume that the that the share of dividends assigned to this household is proportional to its labor income, you, have the, the, you can rewrite the budget constraint where the, the, the labor income for the household simply depends on their synthetic labor productivity and the labor supply. So it, there is no redistributive effects of these dividends. 
So in this way, like we kill all the effects coming from taxes and dividend fluctuations. Briefly, the calibration that we use is the same as the one by McKenna Covenant-Stein. So the only difference is, again, zero net supply for government bonds. We assume a positive uh, borrowing limit equal to five times the average uh, monthly income. And uh, for the long-term bonds, we set uh, an amortization rate equal to 0 0.05, which implies a five-year maturity rate, uh, which is the value uh, um, estimated for the US bio uh, We have we we solve the model with the writer method in, in steady state we have, about, we have that about 18 percent of households are the borrowing constraint this number is similar to what mckenna can work in their, uh, their calibration so let me start describing the the main experiment so let's start from a real rate for guidance experiment for k equal to l this means that in this experiment the real rate uh, the central bank announced that it will lower uh, the real rate uh, by, in this case, is by uh, 50 basis points uh, in 12 periods, while the real rate is going to stay constant in all the preceding periods. And in this graph, we compare in the top panel, we compare the total uh, impact uh, of this four organism experiment for the rank model and for our baseline ANC uh, model with, the, with real bonds. So what happens is that in the rank model, as I said at the beginning, uh, the impact on output is constant until uh, the real rate drops and then output goes back to its steady state. Whereas what we have here is in the rate in, the, in our model, we see that the output uh, on impact uh, uh, increases by less compared to the rank model. And uh, there are like, uh, what, what is driving this result is that, again, the, the lower future interest rate is pushing up the price of bonds. And so this is, I'm going to show you in a second, this is going to uh, translate into like a ne negative impact for the network of, uh, of constrained households. We'll have to actually decrease their consumption. And so this, this, this unexpected jump in Q uh, is responsible for this lower output. On the other end, there is also a positive channel, uh, which is what we define, we call a transfer new shock. Uh, so what I plot in the bottom part of this graph is basically, what is the effect only of the expected transfer at time 12 from savers to borrowers associated with the decrease in the real rate? So here I'm killing all the intertemporal part. I'm only looking at the effect of the announcement of the transfer from borrowers to savers. As you see, like this transfer is like has a positive impact. Uh, I mean, it's not so big on even like at time zero. And then it, when the when the real rate declines this impact uh, uh, becomes larger. But so this is like a, a new, an extra channel that you have when you have uh, uh, borrowers and, and savers, this transfer from like a real uh, IMPC, uh, low MPC agents to uh, IMPC agents in the future, decreases the precautionary motives, it pushes up consumption even in the beginning. Now, if you do this experiment for different horizontal forward guidance, uh, here on the, on the horizontal axis, I'm moving K, and whereas here I'm plotting the impact at time zero for output inflation in Q. You see that uh, the red line again is the rank model with this impact is constant. You see that uh, uh, the impact of for guidance uh, in the rank model increases as the horizon goes down a little bit. And this is due to the fact that the farther away in the future, um, the announcement of lower interest rate occurs, the lower is the impact on, the, the lower is the jump in uh, the price of bonds today, uh, because the price of bonds is going to be a present discounted uh, value of the coupon rate uh, discounted with the, with the flow of the, uh, with the path of the interest rate. So like as this effect goes down, uh, the impact of foreign currencies became large, becomes larger. Yet the impact on inflation is increasing in K, but this doesn't have any, any effect on with real bonds since the real rate is fixed. And if we, we can also look at the, the same graph, but we can look at a different impact for different groups of households. The blue line are the constrained households, uh, the constrained borrowers, the red dotted the dashed line are the constrained, sorry, the unconstrained borrowers, and the pink dashed line are the constrained, the, sorry, the unconstrained set. This is the consumption of all these households. So we see that what really uh, drives down 
um, the effect of our guidance in this model is that the constraint household consumption uh, goes down, uh, at least when the horizon is short, uh, and then this effect becomes smaller and smaller as the decline in cubic, as, it, as the jump in cubic becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, on the other end, you have a positive effect uh, uh, for the either to age and the unconstrained savers and the unconstrained borrowers. And on the right hand side, I'm only isolating the effect over different horizon of the transfer new shock. And this, this shock is stronger for unconstrained borrowers who have the largest uh, uh, precautionary motives, especially in shorter horizons. But then as the horizon goes, goes uh, further in the future, all these households expect to be uh, expect to have the same bond holding they, con they convert toward the gold distribution. So the inf impact becomes very similar across groups. And if we redo the same experiment for different uh, bond maturities, uh, the blue line is the baseline. The blue dashed line is a one period bond. So we have that in this case, the transfer new shock uh, pushes at least for like for shorter horizon, uh, the impact of our guidance becomes stronger than in the rank. Whereas if we increase the the maturity even further to a 20 year bond, the impact is reducing, is reduced even more. This comes from the fact that the, the price of bonds goes up uh, uh, more the longer is the maturity uh, of, the, of, the, of the debt. Um, next, uh, move to nominal bonds. So this is the same experiment that we ran before, fixed real rate with the, which declines the period 12. What we have here though is a big jump at the beginning. And this is due to two effects. First of all, inflation goes up, and that is nominal. So we have that deflation channel that pushes up the consumption of borrowers and we have higher NPC. But in addition, we have that in this case, instead of going up, Q is going down. And this comes from the fact that the whole path of inflation is higher now. And since that is, is nominal, the real value of this debt is, uh, is declined. So also this, this devaluation, uh, gives an extra kick to the consumption of constrained borrowers. So this pushes output up uh, even more. And then you have again the usual transfer new uh, channel that is even amplified because of its interaction with inflation. And if we do the same experiment for different uh, maturities, we have that uh, here, the longer the maturity, so the blue line, the blue line is uh, five year maturity, the dotted line is 20 years, the stronger is the impact uh, of forward guidance for nominal bonds because the larger is the decline in Q. So this is the opposite effect compared to, um, to the real bonds. And again, if we look at the, the, the composition across savers and borrowers, we see here that the, the driver of the larger impact for guidance is that uh, uh, constrained household consumption actually goes up by a lot because of this, of this depreciation of the outstanding, uh, outstanding debt. So next, I think this is good, the last thing I'll be able to show you is uh, the, another type of experiment where, which we call nominal rate for organics in which the real rate declines in the eight period from now, but there is a nominal rate that is kept fixed by the central bank. So this is similar to what the CLB. So in which case the extra channel that we have is that the real rate is allowed to decline on impact and it stays low. So we are comparing the uh, the nominal bond in black dash line and the, re and the uh, real bond, uh, the blue line. So we see that uh, um, again, we have that uh, for the real bond, this lower real rate pushes uh, uh, the, the price of, uh, of long-term bonds higher for, uh, for longer compared to the previous experiment. And that's why uh, we have that on impact, uh, the effect for the real bonds can be smaller than rank. Uh, whereas for the, for the uh, nominal bonds, we have that the price goes up because now the real rate is lower for the whole, uh, uh, for the whole horizon until the for organs announcement. But the big spike in inflation prevents Q from jumping as much as for the real bonds. So we have like actually larger uh, uh, impact coming from the deflation. In addition, the impact of our currency in this case is much larger because we have a lower part of the real rate, uh, which gives you the standard amplification coming from intertemporal uh, motives. Now, if we compare, uh, if we do the same graph for different horizons, uh, we see that uh, uh, in this case, um, the, um, the 
the impact of forbearance uh, is weak, can be weaker for the uh, real bond uh, and model coming from the fact that Q uh, keeps increasing more and more, whereas for the nominal bonds, since the increase in Q is, uh, uh, is cut by the uh, higher inflation, uh, we have that actually this, this, uh, the impact of forbearance becomes uh, larger during the, during the rank model. And this channel basically can give you uh, the same uh, uh, comparative power for guidance also for, uh, for an experiment at the ZLB and liquidity trap. Now I don't have time to show that. And uh, I think I conclude here in some amount of time. Just to conclude, so we show that non uh, in a Hank model introduces three uh, redistributed channels for forward guidance. Uh, a transfer of news channel that revise for guidance by reducing precautionary motive, a Fisher channel that uh, uh, amplifies the power of forward guidance through the deflation, and then when bonds are long term, we have like uh, a debt deflation channel that amplifies the power of forward guidance for nominal bonds, but can reduce it for your bonds. And uh, in a liquidity trap, uh, we have that uh, all these channels push up, make, make the powers of forward guidance stronger in, in uh, rank than in rank, whereas for real bonds, if the maturity is long enough, uh, this result can be uh, overturned. Thank you. So I think I'm a couple of minutes out of time. Okay, thank you very much, Francesco. So if there is any question on the, um, on the paper, you can also type in the Q&A and I will read the questions for you. Francesca, I was just wondering if, having, if I understand correctly, you have an exogenous borrowing limit, uh, right? Does it matter for the results or not? Really? Correct. Yeah, that can, uh, of course, that can make a difference. Uh, we are using like the most, uh, the simplest uh, set up here um, because we want to mainly look at the redistributive effects. Then obviously, uh, if you have, for example, a collateral constraint, if you have a more complex model with like another asset, etc., uh, you have that the true asset price, price is, uh, monetary policy is also going to affect directly how tight the constraint is. So it's going to affect precautionary motives, etc. Uh, this uh, obviously is an important channel, uh, but for for now, we are keeping this, uh, uh, this, this channel uh, uh, shut off just because we want to focus on the redistributive effects. But that, that, that's necessary. That's very important as well. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, maybe Martina can upload uh, her slides. Okay, excellent. Very Perfect. Good. So, uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for including our paper into the program. And so what I'm going to present today is the joint work with uh, Katerina, who's here, uh, as well as Ettore Panetti at the Bank of Portugal, Jose Luis Pedro at Imperial College, and Dominic Supera at Wharton. So let me jump right into the paper. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, labor income inequality or income inequality more broadly has been at the forefront of the policy discussion. Uh, very interestingly, it has also become a, a forefront of the monetary policy discussion in the recent years. And that basically motivates us of looking uh, more closely into the question of monetary policy and labor income inequality in this specific project. Now, before I start, I would like to point out that while we are perfectly aware of the fact that the monetary policy is not intended to redistribute income or wealth in the economy, it is also not immune to such redistributive consequences. So the aim of this project is basically to understand what are the redistributive consequences of the monetary policy changes. And furthermore, uh, additional motivation for this uh, paper comes from the academic research that has strengthened uh, the work on the heterogeneous agent models. And specifically, it has investigated uh, the questions about who are the winners and losers of monetary policy in terms of income consumption, etc. And so we view this empirical work that I'll uh, present in a couple of seconds as a potential empirical contribution to also start thinking about uh, elasticities that can better inform uh, our theoretical models. So let me jump uh, directly to what we do. So in this paper, we try to answer two key questions. The main questions are, how does monetary policy affect labor income inequality? And then what is the role of credit 
in the transmission mechanism. So this is an empirical paper, and we believe that there's actually a very limited empirical evidence in the field. And if you think about uh, the possible sources for such limited evidence, um, there can be twofold. On one side, uh, there's a lack of data, which can be triggered by the measurement issues, but also the, the granularity that could allow us to actually speak to some of the inequality changes uh, related to the monetary policy. On the other hand, potentially even a bigger issue can be related to the identification. And what I mean by that is that monetary policy reacts to labor markets. So you can also think of a potential reverse causality threats, which can make it really difficult to answer questions about how monetary policy re uh, reacts to affects the labor income inequality. So what do we do in this paper specifically? We try to tackle these challenges by uh, looking into the setting of Portugal. And I'll give you a couple of more details a bit later, but let me tell you two important things now. We believe that actually the focus on Portugal allows us to overcome these two uh, biggest challenges. On the data side, we are able to exploit a matching of the granular employee-employer data of all private sector firms, and we are able to match this with the universal credit registry of all bank lending in Portugal. Uh, on the identification side, we uh, will be investigating the impact of the monetary policy, which is set in Frankfurt by the ECB for the entire Eurozone on the local labor income conditions in the Portuguese economy. And so taking these two things together, we would uh, like to argue that the Portugal is actually a really interesting setting to, to explore these questions. So uh, before I jump into the actual presentation, let me give you an overview of all the results that are relevant for this paper. So the main thing uh, that we find in the paper is that softer monetary policy, in other words, lowering of the interest rates, reduces labor income inequality. Now, when we think of labor income inequality, in the paper, we explore multiple margins. We look at the wages, hours work, and worker level and firm level, sorry, firm level employment. So for the purposes of today's talk, I will only talk about the wages, but uh, our wage results are actually consistent with the results related to hours work and uh, employment. So what I mean by softer monetary policy reduces labor income inequality. So we start by looking at the cross-section of firms. And what we find here is that softer monetary policy conditions increase wages more for workers who are employed in firms that are smaller and younger. And these results are even stronger if these firms are highly levered. Now, in the paper, we argue that this result is consistent with the backloaded wage mechanism, which in other words says uh, that the monetary policy relaxes financial constraints and it allows firms to increase wage profiles to their originally backloaded workers. Now, the second thing we do in the paper is that we look at the characteristics of these workers. And what we find is that the workers that benefit most from the softening of the monetary policy conditions are low wage workers. We go deeper into the characteristics of these workers and we find that these effects are particularly strong for workers who are young, educated and female. Now, these are the workers that were originally backloaded by the financially constrained firms, and now as the monetary policy softened, they receive the steepest wage profile. Uh, now, in the second part of the paper, we try to speak more closely to the mechanism. And in particular, we argue that the credit channel actually plays a very important role in the transmission. When I say credit channel, we look into two uh, flavors of the credit channel, the firm balance sheet channel or the firm borrowing channel and the bank lending channel. And we find that both of them are actually operational, which suggests that by alleviating firm and bank financial constraints, softening of the monetary policy eases access to credit for constrained firms and also for the firms borrowing from less healthy or less liquid banks. Now, at the very end of the paper, we also try to understand some, uh, a little bit more um, the state dependent of our results. And we find that these effects are actually stronger in times of crisis, which would suggest that in times of uh, a crisis, we see that the financial constraints are more severe. So the relaxation of financial constraints due to the softening of the monetary policy actually has a bigger bite and a stronger effect on the labor income redistribution. Okay. So as I promised, let me tell you a little bit more about our setting in Portugal. 
So we believe that the focus on Portugal actually allows us to overcome key identification and data challenges. So on the data side, as I already alluded to, we have a, a availability of very detailed match micro level data, most uh, importantly, a um, uh, high quality employer em employer employee data set that tracks the workers over time as they move between the jobs. And we are able to match this with the universal credit registry. Now, uh, importantly, the setting of Portugal allows us to at least partially argue that the monetary policy is exogenous to the local labor market. What I mean by this is that in the paper, we look into the effects of the monetary policy on labor income from 1999 to 2013. And starting 1999 is the time when the Portugal access the euro system and the monetary policy has been collectively set uh, in Frankfurt for all the euro member states. Now, importantly, Portugal contributes only very little to the euro area GDP. And uh, even uh, more relevant, Portuguese economy has been very sluggish uh, following the euro area creation. And there's a uh, growing evidence showing that the Portuguese business cycle has not fully converged with the core, core euro area. So you would be thinking that the monetary policy softening actually hits the Portuguese economy at the times where aren't exactly reflecting the, the nature of the, of the Portuguese uh, business cycle. Uh, now, we will take additional steps in our identifications to be more cautious about uh, the exogenous uh, uh, character of the monetary policy, and I'll speak about it just in a couple of slides. Uh, the final reason why Portugal is an interesting uh, setting to look at is that we want to understand whether these changes are state dependent. In other words, whether uh, there is a difference in monetary policy during the crisis period versus normal times. And again, the setting of Portugal allows us to look in the country that has not only suffered from the global financial crisis, but more importantly, also through uh, the European sovereign debt crisis. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a very quick preview of the data and methodology, and then I'm going to talk about the three results, the redistributive wage effects, the credit mechanism, and then uh, the role of the crisis. So let me jump straight to the data. So in this paper, we merge a couple of granular micro-level data set, and as I've mentioned, the most important are the first two, which uh, is the employee-employer data set Quadro Pessoal, which allows us to track private sector workers of all private sector firms with at least one paid employee, and we're using the data set from 1999 to 2013. And one of the advantages that we are able to observe a rich set of uh, observables both on the worker and the firm level side. We are also able to match this data with the universal credit registry. So we observe the borrowing of the firms from banks that are um, active in Portugal. And then finally, we match this with a more standard firm level, bank level, monetary policy or broader macro controls. Okay, great. And so in the methodology, we will be looking at two things. In the first part, we will try to just document the redistributive wage effects. So what I mean by this is that we will be following the individuals over time as they move between the firms and we will first separately identify the impact of their worker firm or time effects on their wages and we will be after examining an additional heterogeneous response on their wages uh, that is related to the monetary policy. And when I say heterogeneous, we'll be looking at the number of margins. So we'll, on the firm side, we'll be looking at the impact of the firm size or the age of the firm. And then when we move to the worker, I'll talk a little bit about the role of the workers' wages, gender, age, and education. Now, in the second part, I'll go deeper into the mechanism, and we'll here exploit the matching between the employee-employer and credit registries and derive some specific sensitivities to monetary policy through the credit channel. All right, so the equation that you see on the slide is basically summarizing the first part of the empirical strategy. So on the left hand side you see our outcome variable which here is defined as the log of hourly wage of the worker W in the firm F over the year T. We do a bunch of robustness checks so today I'll be talking about hourly wages. The results are robust for monthly wages and as I mentioned they are also consistent if you look at employment or hours work. Now the most important coefficient will be after is this uh, beta and so let's look into this double interaction that's highlighted here in orange. So the R represents a measure of the monetary policy stance. And for today, I'll be using an EONIA, which is basically a European Fed funds rate as a proxy of the monetary policy stance. In the robustness, we also think about the R more seriously and we replace it not only with MRO, which is the key policy rate of the ECB, but also with the shadow rate so that we are able to think about uh, both conventional and unconventional monetary policy changes, but also with the monetary policy surprises a la the work of uh, Mara Giarocinski and Peter Karadik. 
uh, okay. And now finally, the most interesting thing we'll be uh, looking at today is this H, which will be representing a specific heterogeneity. So I'll start by talking about the, firm, the impact of firm level heterogeneity, such as the impact on the firm size or age, and then I'll talk a little bit about the work level heterogeneity. So the specification as such, allows us to saturate the model with a set of fixed effects which basically uh, allow us to follow the individuals over time and separately identify uh, the impact on the wages from their uh, time fixed effect component as well as the permanent worker level and firm level components and we'll be interested in really just this additional kick that is coming from the changes of the monetary policy. All right, so let me give you a, a preview of uh, one of the results. So let's start for example by looking at the firm size. So here we're splitting the firms uh, into large and small firms. And let me maybe uh, start by uh, commenting on the column one. In column one, first of all, this is the regression without any uh, fixed effect, uh, but it allows us to see the coefficient on the monetary policy rate as such. So as one might predict, uh, what we are seeing is that lowering of the monetary policy rate. So when the interest rates go down, the wages increase. Now, what's much more important for us is this heterogeneity that's coming from the interaction of the small firm and R. And we see that this coefficient is negative and statistically significant, meaning that workers employed in small firms benefit additionally more than the workers employed uh, in larger firms. Now, what's most interesting for us are the columns six and seven, which really saturate the model with the fixed effects I talked about. And if we want to give this an economic interpretation, we would say that the one percentage point decrease in the monetary policy rates is associated with approximately 1.12 percentage point increase in uh, wages for workers employed in smaller firms compared to workers in larger firms. Now, I believe graphs are nicer than tables. So from now on, I will switch the format from these tables. And instead, I'll be showing you the results in the graphs. The graphs will do basically the same thing. It's just that we are splitting the firms uh, by the characteristics into quintiles. And we will be using the top quintile as a reference point. So in this case, I'm showing you the reference are the largest firms in Portugal. And I'm showing you that one more time, workers in uh, smaller firms are having this negative and statistically uh, significant effects. So they, they actually benefit more from the monetary policy softening than the workers who are employed in uh, large firms. The result is also uh, consistent if we look into the world of young firms. So once again, we see that workers in young firms benefit more. And interestingly, if you were to run age and size together, we would find that both of these margins matter independently. Finally, as I mentioned already, uh, these effects are stronger when you would interact these results with leverage. So it's really the small levered and the young levered firms and their workers who benefit most from the monetary policy softening. Now you might ask, why do we think this is so? And in the paper, we argue that this is related to the backloaded wage mechanism, which seems to be operational also in the context of monetary policy. So what do I mean by that? First thing is that generally looking into the data, we know that workers in small and young firms earn less. So here I'm just showing you the data for a representative year of 2010 uh, and the median wages across the, the groups. Now, the literature has also shown that generally small and young firms tend to be financially constrained. And if we think about this, we can borrow from uh, the findings either of Mikulaci Quadrini or Chiuso Pistaferis Kivardi, which have shown that financially constrained firms tend to offer backloaded wages. So in other words, they tend to borrow from their workers while they're financially constrained. And as the financial constraint of the firm relaxes, they increase the wage profiles for the workers that had been originally backloaded. So in the, our context of the monetary policy, we are uh, basically trying to examine that the monetary policy softening relaxes the financial constraints and it specifically does so for the small and young firms which are financially constrained and we see that these smaller young firms increase the wages by more than their unconstrained peers which means that as these firms generally tend to pay less the income uh, dispersion between the firms decreases. Now to be actually able to speak uh, to this uh, specific channel we need to look into two things. So the first one is that we will show that small and young firms actually do pay backloaded wages. And we will do that by comparing the wage profiles of their new hires and their existing workers. And then later in the talk, I'll show you that, there's a, that we have also developed a new measure of the sensitivity to show that small and young firms are indeed financially constrained using our credit registry data. So let me talk a lot, little bit about the first point. So what we do first is that we compare the wage profile of the new hires and existing workers, either by splitting the firms into small and large or using the full sample. 
And what you see is, first of all, we do see these effects on the small firms, but by and large, the impact on the small firms is being driven by the stayers. So these are the guys who were previously hired uh, in the firm, and we would argue that their wages were originally backloaded. So now the softening of the monetary policy is releasing these uh, original backloaded wages, and the stayers in smaller or younger firms are now uh, seeing these steepest wage profiles on their wages. Good. So let me very briefly mention some results on the worker heterogeneity. So the first thing that I'd like to show you is that if you would think about who are these specific workers in the uh, small or young firms that benefit the most, you could see uh, that these are the workers who are generally low wage. So once again, we're, we're, we're uh, using the highest wage workers as a reference group and you see that the result is primarily being driven by the lower wage categories. Now here I'm showing you the results between firms, but this result is also consistent if you look into within firm inequality. We tried to go deeper and we tried to understand who are these workers who are low wage earners. And interestingly, what we find is that these guys tend to be younger and college educated. And if we look into the differences between firms, they also tend to be uh, women worker, or female workers as opposed to male. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I would actually like to jump straight to the mechanism. And specifically in this paper, we try to examine what is the role of the credit channel in the transmission of monetary policy to wages. And if you think of credit channels, there are a couple of things that can come to mind. And what we specifically think of in this paper are the two versions of the credit channel. One is the firm balance sheet channel, a la Bernanke Gertler, which argues that softer monetary policy increases firms' asset value and net worth, and thus extends firms' capacity to raise external funds. On the other hand, you can also think about the role of credit through the bank lending channel. And so this is basically either the work of Bernanke Blinder or uh, Kashab Stein. And basically this work has been arguing that expansionary monetary policy positively affects the provision of bank credit supply to the economy. And if we think about the heterogeneity on the bank credit supply, the magnitude should be larger for the banks which have either the poor balance sheet health or they are less liquid. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk, I will examine these two channels separately and then uh, I'll uh, put them together. So let me first talk about the firm balance sheet channel. So as I mentioned in the firm's balance sheet channel, we would argue that the monetary policy propagates more strongly to wages of workers who are employed in firms with a higher sensitivity of credit to monetary policy. And what we do in this paper is that we are not trying to make a specific stance about which specific firm characteristic would make the firm sensitive to monetary policy, but instead we propose a new, uh, more agnostic way to derive these sensitivities. So let me be more specific. So what we actually do is that we go back to our credit registry data and we run the following regressions. Uh, and um, specifically, we are interested in this uh, sensitivity to the monetary policy changes and we are capturing it in an agnostic way. Uh, so we are deriving these, uh, we are trying to estimate this coefficient beta, which uh, one would argue uh, should suggest that the more negative values of beta should correspond with the firms having a stronger sensitivity to monetary policy. So one interesting thing is that we, while we are trying to be agnostic, we check for the a correlation of this beta with other uh, firm characteristics and we actually find that small and young firms are actually more sensitive to monetary policy. So in the paper we document the correlation of this beta to some specific observables, but for the main part we keep this agnostic. Now what we do then is that we take the fitted values of this beta and we plug them back to our wage level regressions. So we're using this as a source of heterogeneity, which is to say that we are trying to understand that whether the monetary policy, uh, uh, whether the balance sheet channel of the, of the credit is at work. And this would mean that if it is so, then the wages of workers who are employed in firms with a higher sensitivity to monetary policy should see a higher increase of their wages following the monetary policy softening. In other words, we should see that this theta parameter here should be positive and statistically significant. And this is exactly what I'm showing you here by actually running the regression results. Uh, now, let me turn very briefly to the bank lending channel. So if we again go back to the uh, bank lending channel literature, this is the stream of literature that has argued that is uh, the health condition or the liquidity position of the banks that help us understand these heterogeneous effects. So what we do in the paper, we one more time derive uh, the sensitivities. So we first derive a bank health. And for here, again, we try to make a little bit of contribution by looking at the bank health in a more agnostic way, following, for example, the Amity and Weinstein's JPE work, where we derive the bank specific shocks, and then we aggregate them on the firm level. In parallel, we also look into the 
uh, bank level holding of liquid assets and we use that as a sort of heterogeneity. Now what we do here is again a very similar approach to the uh, firm borrowing channel you've just seen. So we first run the loan level regressions, then we aggregate these results on the firm uh, level, and then we finally take this coefficient and we run it on our wage regression. So for the sake of time, I'm only showing you the final stage where we go back to our wage regressions and we're using this heterogeneity that we retrieve uh, from the uh, credit level data. So specifically here, I'm showing you the bank lending channel using the measure of the bank health. And uh, once again, what you see here is that coefficients are positive and statistically significant, which suggests that banks that are borrowing from a less healthy banks uh, following the monetary policy shocks, uh, their workers benefit, firms that are borrowing more from a less liquid banks, their workers benefit more from monetary policy softening than the workers of other uh, firms. Now, uh, this is the bank health in the paper. We show that this result is uh, strong and robust also to the measure of the bank liquidity. Now, I'd like to use the remaining two, three minutes to talk a little bit about the state dependent result when we look into the period of crisis. So the first result we find in the paper is that while workers in small and young firms generally benefit from softening of the monetary policy conditions, these results are roughly two to three times stronger in the times of crisis. So what we actually want to understand here is how are these channels operational in times of crisis? The way we answer this question is that we go back to our wage level regressions, uh, but now we introduce an additional coefficient with a triple interaction when we not only take our sensitivity to the specific credit channel monetary policy rate, but we also interacted with the domestic GDP as a proxy of local economic conditions. And what you see here is that that coefficient appears to be highly relevant. And in other words, it suggests that the firm balance sheet channel is actually more active in times of the economic downturn. The same is true if you proxy for the credit channel using the bank lending, uh, and this is either through the bank uh, health uh, or the bank uh, proportion of liquid assets. And once again, you find that the bank uh, lending channel is again uh, stronger in the times of the crisis. This would speak to the fact that in times of crisis, we know that the financial constraints of both firms and banks are more binding. And so softening of the monetary policy actually has a bigger bite in relieving the credit constraint that's actually much more severe, which more positively propagates to uh, the wages of workers. So let me wrap up. So what we do in this paper is that we try to argue that the monetary policy actually has important implications on the redistributive effects on the labor market. And specifically, we highlight the role of the credit channel in the transmission of monetary policy to these labor market outcomes. Thank you. So thank you, Martina, very much for the presentation. So in case there is any question, the panelists can ask directly, whereas the other participants could write in the Q&A and I'm going to read the question. So please feel free to ask anything if you like. I have a question, yeah. if no, I may, I'm, I'm Roger here. <clears throat> so, um, Th thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting work. My, my question is about um, your agnostic methodology to um, kind of measure the firm balance sheet effect and the bank lending uh, effects. Uh, and I think I was a bit confused <clears throat> from it because it's, uh, I had the impression it was a bit circular in the sense that you first try to gauge how sensitive, uh, let's say, firms are to a monetary policy change and then uh, use that sense estimated sensitivity back in your in your first regression on, in your wage regression. Um, oh, yeah, thank, thanks for the slide. Mm -hmm. um, so, could it be? I guess the concern I have is uh, something on the lines of um, uh, of the role the time sector fixed effect could capture, for example. So, let's assume I'm in a sector that is more sensitive to monetary policy than you are. And so I'm going to have a higher beta than you have. Um, how, how can you control for that? Uh, yes, at all? absolutely. That, that's an okay. excellent point. I actually uh, don't have a slide here, but this is, so this is the 
crudest version of you might have in mind. And now there are these additional worries. So you're absolutely right that the sector or the sector time fixed effect might matter a lot. So in the robustness, we control both for sector time. We also control for region time of the, of the firm. Uh, in addition, we also control for the previous credit. We also control for the role of credit dynamics. We try to introduce a bunch of controls to really make sure that, as you're absolutely on point, might potentially confound this result. So, so yes. And if I if I may follow up, is there any reason why this approach should be preferred or superior to uh, to having, uh, let's say, an interaction in your first equation? an interaction of uh, your preferred proxy for financial constraints relative to having this reduced form approach? I, I think that really it's, it's probably a matter of, of uh, you know, the taste. So we, in the paper we check uh, and we, we find that if you say in the first stage you would replace uh, and you would look into the size or, or the age of the firm, uh, for example, like the word of, uh, work of Paolo Surico and his co-authors, you would find very consistent results. The reason is that in the first part of the paper, we actually can't say whether this is a size or an age factor. Both of those margins seem to matter. And so here we prefer to take a more agnostic way with I not see. calling which observable it would be. But if you say really would be interested in like believing that this is a thing of the firm size, you would get a very comparable result. So it would, it would be very consistent with what we're showing. The, the only benefit is that this allows you for a little bit more flexibility in, in not constraining sure. yourself of thinking about one specific margin. Thank you very much. So Martina, there is a question from the audience that is related. So there is mm -hmm. someone asking, would it be possible to make clearer the connection between the small and young firms and the state of the balance sheet prior to the monetary policy change? And then there is another question, but the second question is, can you differentiate the effects between the interest rate changes and unconventional measures such as quantitative easing? Excellent. Okay, so uh, let me start from the second one. So we are actually ending our sample in 2000. 13, so we are not having QE in the sample as such. So most of the monetary policy changes here, I'm really talking early 2000, so it's primarily conventional monetary policy. But you're right, there are unconventional changes that you might want to have in mind, such as fixed rate full allotment, the LTRO, and whatnot. So we actually, in the paper, run these the same regressions, but using the Venshin do measure of the shadow rates, and the results are consistent. We believe that this the consistency really comes from the fact that there are not that many unconventional pol monetary policies in our sample. But this would definitely be very different if you were to say extend the sample period all the way up to today. So that's the one. The other thing is whether we are able to differentiate uh, uh, the, uh, the what's the connection the, between the small and young firms and the state of, of their balance sheet. That's an interesting point. We actually haven't looked at the balance sheet of the small and young firms, so we can definitely do that. The only thing we have done for now is that we differentiate based on their leverage, and we see that these effects are stronger for more levered small and young firms. So you might argue whether these firms are, say, less healthy in terms of their balance sheet position, but this is definitely a good suggestion that we can, we can take a look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so... Um... If there are no other questions, we can uh, close this session right on time. And uh, so, okay, it's still not closed. It's going to be closed in one minute. So thank you very much for everyone for attending the session and uh, see you in the next session. So then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katerina, for sharing and Bye. thanks for the presentations. Bye. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.